Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really all we've got to do. How long does it take a jet to get up? Yeah. Can, can we get over land before a jet comes around? Well, we're, we're, we're just still trips with somebody. You used to see them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just screaming off. Could it say yes? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, February's uh, council meeting. I need to first advise you that this meeting will be recorded for both live and subsequent broadcasts on the Council's YouTube site. Any members of the public or anybody present in the room is entitled to take photographs or make recordings. Item two is apologies. I've received uh, apologies from uh, Peter Bishop. Cheryl Dornan is substituting. Uh, welcome. Uh, Andy Caldrick, Paul Kitson, Ian McLeod substituted. I can't see Ian at the moment. Uh, and Darren Huckaday. If we could uh, note those apologies. Are there any others? No, thank you. Uh, item three is declaration of interest. Anybody wish to declare an interest, Robert? Uh, thank you. Item six mentions um, a Birmingham Museum Trust in it. So uh, just declare an interest as a council appointed director on it, and my wife works for the trust. Be noted. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, item four is the minutes. So we're all content that the minutes of our meeting on Tuesday, the 17th of January, are accurate. That's agreed. I'll sign them in due course. Item five, then, is exempt information. Uh, we have one uh, item, item 21 on today's agenda, has an exempt appendix attached. Does anybody wish to raise anything on that appendix? So, in which case we proceed as set out on the agenda, which takes me to item six, which is the outline business case for the Commonwealth Games Legacy Programme. This report will establish and operate a Birmingham City Council legacy portfolio that will coordinate resource and the continued delivery of the Council's legacy ambitions. There are two principal objectives for this portfolio. The first is to inspire, oversee and assure projects which will fulfil the Council's commitments and ambitions to realise a legacy value for the City of Birmingham arising from hosting the Games, and secondly, to compile a single view of the benefits achieved for the City as a result of delivering the legacy plan. There will be a legacy team, and they will support the wider City transformational plan and priorities, and it will operate for a defined initial period of two years to allow the Council to capture the immediate short-term benefits of the Games and to align with the likely availability of Commonwealth Games legacy funding that is being channelled through the combined authority. Included within the uh, portfolio are a number of key priorities, but I wanted to flag up two in particular. That is the European Athletics Championships in 2026 and the city's uh, aspiration to host uh, an international festival in the future. The first iteration of that will be this coming summer, final week of July, first week of August, and we'll look to build that up over a number of years into something that is genuinely international. The um, outcomes that we're looking to achieve from the legacy plan are set out in paragraph 3.7, but as I've always said, the legacy from the Games uh, is far more important than hosting the event itself. Uh, we have already um, achieved more uh, in investment in this city than it cost us to host the Games. So we spent £184 million hosting the Games. We've already seen investment into this city in exceeding £800 million that we expect to grow to over a billion in the future. And just to remind everyone, for every one pound we spent, the government invested three pounds in our city in hosting the game. So this has been an event that's been very, very good value for money for the city and the taxpayer, an event that will also continue to deliver legacy benefits for the people of Birmingham for years to come. Jane, do you wish to add anything? Yeah. Thank you, Leader. Um, I think everybody will recognise that the city made a commitment that the Commonwealth Games would be more about just sport. And we have before us, I think, colleagues, uh, a bold legacy plan, which has been shaped by the people um, in the city who've had involvement with the game. So it will help accelerate the aspirations of our citizens. So essentially, the report lays out our approach by the legacy portfolio team to continue, contribute and support and drive forward to our city's ambitions. And the team will act as a central entity and coordinating body to provide structure, oversight and assurance of any legacy projects utilising the Games underspend. 
It will be through the portfolio of governments detailed in the report that decisions about new projects have been made and a programme will be very carefully monitored, maintained and communicated. It's vital we maximise the positive impact of staging the Games for all people in all of our neighbourhoods across the city. And this report clearly outlines how we'll ensure the benefits of Birmingham 22 are felt across the city for years to come. Thank you, Pete. Thanks very much, Ian. Ewan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ian. And I, I think, you know, a bit of good start, cabinet with a bit of commonality, because I think I agree with you completely. Uh, I think the Games itself was Birmingham working uh, hand in hand with the government as a joint partnership to produce um, what has been a superb Commonwealth Games. I think we can all agree on that. And I agree with you completely. I think the legacy is the most important thing that the judge will be game, the, the Games will be judged by. Ultimately, I think it's important that the legacy touches the whole of the city because I think that's, you know, it's, it's for everyone. And um, sort of, you know, follow your sort of uh, way that there's sort of two bits I was going to highlight here. I think the... I think the physical infrastructure going in is really important because that, that probably is, is the bit that will last the longest. The, everyone can see that and identify with that. And so the three items that I mentioned there um, fully uh, fully support those. Um, I noticed that the City of Ideas Museum gets a mention but doesn't seem to have much sort of detail or commitments around it. But I think that's equally is important. I see there's no location specified. And I was just wondering if sort of uh, to get the ball rolling on that, if Northfield would be a good location for it. It's got a large industrial heritage. I think it's a good chance that some of the local businesses there could support that. And I think that could be something that another thing that we could positively take forward from that. So, you know, that that was my bit for a um, bit more commonality on there. Thank you, Rick. We have carried out uh, an exercise actually to identify a site that has uh, concluded on a specific location, which I won't mention in this public meeting, but I'm more than happy to discuss that with you outside of the meeting. John. Thank you. I agree the legacy is important. Um, I think, think there's expectation around it. I think given the success of the Games, I think there's, there's, there's real opportunities there. I've got a few questions about this approach. Um, the portfolio is established and it's designed as a sort of management structure to make things happen. But I just wondered about the accountability to cabinet. I presume yourself and Councillor Francis would be overseeing things. But the report, for instance, refers to multiple potential projects have emerged. And if I read the report correctly, of the expected um, funds available, there's about £15 million pounds un unallocated currently. And I do wonder whether you might benefit from, say, a cabinet committee to oversee the whole process. Um, and ensure the legacy really is driving improvements for the whole city. Um, and from from my side, I would pitch as a reference in here to elements delivered through wards from uh, community programmes. I think that's two million pounds in this currently for that. But I do think you should consider a, an infrastructure legacy programme across the city, which would devolve um, an equivalent of capital funding towards so that local projects, local facilities could be branded with the small bar games facilities that benefit from from that investment. Well, thank you for that offer. Um, but I think Jane and I will be able to oversee this uh, legacy program quite adequately. We will, of course, regularly report back to Cabinet on progress with uh, delivering the uh, legacy. On the suggestion that we might um, allocate more funding uh, out locally, we'll consider that going forward. But one of the things that's at the forefront of my mind is that if we start dividing this money up into two smaller packages, we will end up frittering away uh, the monies rather than investing in something that will have a long lasting benefit for the city and for the people of this city. So we'll, Jane and I will consider what you've said, but uh, at the moment I'm not minded to go down the route that you're indicating. If there's no further comments, are we happy to agree the, the recommendations uh, 2 1 through to 2 1 8? Item 7 then is the financial monitoring report for quarter three. Yvonne. So, Lisa, this is a report on the financial position for quarter three. The council's strategic aim is to deliver within the revenue budget. However, given the cost of living crisis and the pressures within our travel services, this year has been particularly tough. There is a risk that it is not sufficient in these pressures. We will not expend at the end of the year. The potential overspend is now standing at 11 million. This is a significant improvement on some 26.7 million since month eight. 
There are two main improvements that are in Our underlying field reserves, we have been able to identify 21.8 million of these of service reserves that are no longer required. Please note that it's not 21.5 million as in the last show in paragraph 1.8. Good housekeeping has also meant that we are forecasting 9.4 million, 5 million, sorry, of savings on the policy contingency budget. Work will continue in order to bring this down to a balanced budget position by the end of the financial year. The rigorous spending controls reintroduced in July 2022 are helping to bring down the forecast overspend. The spending controls focus on staffing and facilities management. We have been placed measures to run up. The benefits of these controls. These the workforce spend controls are delaying recruitment and reducing the use of consultant agents and agency workers wherever possible. So far, we've identified 2.2 million of savings on the employee budgets, but we are confident that there is more to come. The facilities management spend controls are stopping non essential spend whilst ensuring essential health and safety requirements are met. Today, 1.5 million facilities management savings have been approved. Linked to this, we have also reviewed the profit and cyclical repairs and work and plan to reduce this by 8.2 million. For procurement, we have stopped all non essential spending and applied controls to all contracts in an attempt to manage prices or reduce overall spending on contracts. High inflation does make it difficult to achieve savings on contracts. We continue to assume delivery on savings. A number of savings are currently rated as a medium or high risk. The value of high risk savings has, has remained high on chain volume 8 at 4.1 million. The council leadership team is working to ensure that all these savings are achieved by the end of the year. Any non delivery will result in further risk of overspend. In terms of the capital budget, Kevin will be asked to approve an increase in the capital budget from 2022-23 of 5.1 million, resulting in a revised capital budget of 728.6 million. Also, please note that the forecast capital spend is 581.9 million. There is an increase of synergy of 78.8. I set out 4.8. What is undertaken with directors and project managers with small opportunities to reprofile re or reduce capital projects? I would add a reminder that once the council faces a very difficult shopping of financial, it is in a robust financial position with strong financial planning processes in place and on the amount reserves remain healthy and within recommended limits. Um, I'm therefore asking the cabinet to support the recommendations to the Thank you very much. Any comments? John. I, thank you. I'm not quite sure how to reciprocate a cabinet member's greeting, but I do hope she's received some cards today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that helps the empty a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> um, merry day, everybody. The, the um, it is an it's the improvement of 26 million really an improvement if it's taken from drawing money from reserves and from policy contingency because it doesn't suggest the underlying problems are still there I'm sure it's something we might look at in the, in the next item on the next year's budget but i just wondered whether that's a bit the word improvement is appropriate when actually the budget is being balanced using reserves if robert in the spirit the cabinet member said happy valentine's everyone um under 2.2 picking up actually the point john's just said it says the position's improved by 26.7 million um from month eight but when you go down <clears throat> into the appendix on page 69 1.8 it highlights that that's because 21.5 million additional reserves have been used and 9.5 from the policy contingency reserves um and a table one shows that the directorates have overspent by 72 uh, million this year. Uh, that's on. And when you turn to page 83, table 9, 6.28, shows that reserves at the 1st of April, the beginning of the financial year for the city, were 1,071 million. And at the end of this financial year, they'll be down a third at, at 669 million. Uh, and I think the point really here is um, you can use reserves in year to say at the end of the year the budget's balanced instead of using them at the end of the year to balance off the budget. 
but the impact on the budget is exactly the same. Those reserves are still being used. It is not a balanced budget. It's a budget that has been balanced using reserves. Um, turning to Table 2, 1.17, this gives a list of savings that have been identified through spending controls in the organisation this year. Um, this list appears to suggest that spending controls have only been found in two of the directorates, um, adult social care and corporate. Is that correct? And if so, why is there no spending controls um, being found in uh, to be able to find savings in any of the other departments? Um, turning to 2.6, this uh, has revenues and benefits being 3.7 million overspent due to court delays. Um, everyone understands that reason. Uh, that's, that is an understandable reason, but it's also a reason that everyone's known about all year. So why is this something that's only come up on the list now at this point, rather than being flagged as a risk all through the year when those delays have been known about all year as being an issue? Sorry, which one was that? 2.6, page 74. Uh, then on 2.7, there's a, a new overspend relating to additional costs for Oracle. Um, the end of that little bit says some of these costs are likely to impact future financial years. Uh, can we just get uh, an explanation of how much cost is going to be applied in future years from that and is this the end of um, additional costs for Oracle or, or are there more that might yet come through? Then turning to page table four, uh, sorry table four on page 75, that shows the list of saving risks uh, for this year and you can see 21% of savings have only been delivered this year uh, through using reserves and 23% are still medium and high risk going forward. Um, and then on page table eight, sorry, table eight on page uh, crosses over from page 80 to page 81. The table's actually on page 81. Um, this has the policy contingency uh, breakdown of how much is used. Um, and you've got budget uh, had savings to be allocated at the beginning of the year of 21 million. Um, and at the end of the year, those still not being allocated. Um, and we're now in the final quarter. So what's happening with those savings still to be allocated of 31 million? Are they being um, discovered this year or are they being accepted that they're not going to be delivered this year? And therefore, it's the very last line in the um, table, total savings to be allocated. And it's got uh, 30.9, so 31 million. Uh, and it's still remaining to be allocated. Now we're approaching the final quarter. Can you explain what, what's happened there? Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, young and the Roberts. It's called Stand Financial Money Management. Approximately 800 million pounds of overspend, but our last few officers are too Thank you. Yeah, no, quite happy to. So the court income we've been flagging all year um, on the revenues and benefits, okay, um, in, as, a, as a budget risk. Um, this is because we had delays in recovery while we were trying to get, not Oracle, but the uh, the BRS, the bespoke software around it on cash management allocation working. Okay, so we haven't as yet said we won't get all of those in, um, which is why it's being highlighted the high risk one. But that's loss of court income because of delays in court recovery. We were doing non court recovery, but not court recovery. Shall I carry on? That's the word. On the Oracle one next. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So on Oracle, um, and, and we use this term very broadly, a lot of this, the spend that's going into this is actually about business readiness and the processes around it, as well as the bespoke software. So uh, we had exactly the same with the SAP system. Because we, uh, we're, we have significant scale here, we don't use the main SAP or Oracle Bank Reconciliation functions because they cannot deal with the scale, neither can. We had a workaround, in other words, bespoke software with SAP, we've got the same with Oracle. Okay, and, and, and some of the monies is going and ensuring that that's fully working for the bank reconciliation. All monies that are needed for Oracle that we're aware of at this stage are built into future year's budgets, if that, if that helps. Um, on the saving deliveries, and this is really important, we're, we're very uh, robust on this. We will only apply the budget smoothing reserve, which was set two years ago in the budget, uh, 34 million. We only apply it where we are absolutely certain, 100% certain on delivery. It's just taken a bit longer to deliver than we originally expected. That's the 8.8 million that's, that's in table four. Um, on the high risk ones, we, we are not in any way saying they're not achievable. We're saying they're still very high risk. 
Okay, so that's that's uh, that that I think finishes that one off. On the policy contingency, um, I haven't got the answer on me, but um, I have asked the finance officers here to come back on what what's what that figure is made up of. Okay, uh, Robert. Thank you. Just a clarification on the revenue and benefits. So I appreciate the department might have been aware, but the point I was making was why haven't it been reported? And just to quote the report, it says this risk has not been previously reported, so it's an increase of 3.7 million. So it's been on our register, yeah, it's not been reported yeah. previously. Was there an expectation then that we recover those costs? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was the case. Okay. It is. I uh, just want to make a comment on. Uh, the use of reserves position, because I think um, there are two reasons that reserves are being used. First, first of all, there's a number of unexpected events uh, this year. So the uh, cost of the pay award, which was above what was expected when the budget was set, the um, cost of energy, and we've seen energy prices uh, go through the uh, ceiling across uh, recent months. So these are one-off events. The cost of living emergency is another one. Uh, it is appropriate to cover these one-off things from uh, reserves. And then there is the use of reserves set aside in past years that are no longer required. Now, it wouldn't be efficient to leave that money in reserves if it's no longer required for the purpose. So the question you're really posing is, are we kicking the can down the road here or uh, storing a problem for future years? I think to answer that question, you've got to look then at the following report, which sets the budget for next year and future years. And you'll see, if you look in that report, that we are setting balanced budget for next year without the further use of reserves. Ewan. Thank you. And yeah, just while you're talking there, it just struck my mind because obviously we've got Oracle coming back again and having some more money spent on it. Um, ballpark off the top of my head, and I'm sure oh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's spent about 40 million on Oracle at the moment. If you add up everything that's going along with it, it might even be a lot more than that. Um, has Oracle delivered 40 million pounds of improvements over SAP? I'll have to defer to, to Becky Hellard for that. Yeah, no, I'll come back to you. And it's it's not about, it's not a straight equation. It would be much simpler for me to answer if it was. So the SAP system didn't operate in a cloud environment. We can, couldn't continue with an on-premise anyway. So part of the shift was to shift to Oracle. So it's um, it's not a straightforward equation of if you spend 40 million, you get 40 million pounds back. Um, so you know, because there are two business cases in the past that's, I think both since I've been here, the original business case was put forward. A second business case was put forward because the assumptions used in the first business case were flawed, as we explained in, in that cabinet report. <clears throat> and um, and we've set out the benefits that will be delivered. I, th I think the, the the main issue is we couldn't have continued this app. It was it was outside any sort of support, and and it was an on-premise system. We did look at at um, three systems, not just the Oracle system. And that was in the original business case that was reported. Oracle was reported as the best of the three. We could have re-implemented SAP, but it would have been exactly the same as Oracle, a whole re-implementation because the system was old and hadn't been kept updated. Um, a lot of the issues that we're dealing with in the Oracle system is actually uh, problems that were already in the SAP system. And that's around the data that was held within the system. Having done four cleansing rounds, we're still looking the data now. Thank you. OK, can we agree then recommendations 2, 1 through to 2, 11? Agreed? Agree. Thank you. Uh, item 8 is the draft financial plan. This report sets out the budget for 23-24 and financial planning context for the council for the period through to 2032-33. But obviously there is an emphasis on the medium term financial plan, which is through to 26-27. Uh, this report will be considered by full council on the 28th of February, but it lays out the net revenue budget of some 925.1 million and a capital budget of 1.6 million. There is a uh, supplementary report that is tabled at this meeting. The reason this report is tabled so late is that uh, the draft financial plan was published on Monday the 6th of February, at which point we had still not received the final local government finance settlement from government. We received that the following day on Tuesday the 7th of February. So you'll see in this report there are some marginal amendments to the numbers. Happy to take any comments or questions. John. Thank you and uh, we'll make a full response at the meeting on the 28th of February. Of course a couple of questions if I may. Um, 
One is that the midterm financial plan predicted an £80 million gap for the coming year, and all of a sudden the savings target for this year is £48 million, which is significantly less than £80 million. I just wondered whether we could have an explanation of, of, of where the £32 million is, what success has achieved in narrowing of that gap. Um, secondly, picking up a question I raised with you last week at the Council meeting, the impact of the, the vacancy turnovers um, is quite a neat thing to do to delay vacancy recruitment by, by two weeks. Um, and I think the plan sets a 3% target for each department to be achieved by that means. And uh, one suspects that departments and directorates will, will use their own to meet that target. It's going to be quite a difficult one to, to measure uh, that it's happening. What sort of overall supervision is there going to be of the impact of that on performance? Um, but the third question is about the, the planning ahead for future years, because that there is a, a couple of headings in there which set out objectives for future years, particularly around youth services and library services. And I think um, the target for next year is to get a £1.7 million saving in library services. Um, is it the administration's view that this will be achieved without an impact on services, or, or are we to expect um, uh, risks to, to local libraries? Robert. Thank you. Um, and obviously, as you'd expect, we'll, we'll save most of the uh, political points about it for the actual budget debate itself. So I just wanted to pick up two things. Um, the first actually is on, on what just John's just mentioned there about libraries. And, and can you give a commitment that over the four years of this budget, it means that no library will close? Um, because when you read the, um, the reports, it doesn't give that impression that, that all libraries in the city are safe for the four years of this report. Uh, and also, I'd, I'd raise some concerns about the increasing accounts tax. Clearly, you've, you've already highlighted the cost of living crisis there is at the moment um, and the large proposal to increase council tax this year and in future years as well um, really is a, a negative, I think, at this time, which is going to hurt many people in the city. Yvonne. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, we will all be acutely aware of the economic context within which we are living. Um, the national, the impact of the pandemic, the national challenge of the rising cost and the rising cost of inflation and cost of living, increase in demand and reduced government funding. Birmingham City Council, like many councils, is facing an increasingly challenging financial situation. These factors have added pressure to the council's finances, both for the financial position 2023-24 and the medium-term financial outlook. Despite these challenges, through extensive hard work, medium term financial strategy. The proposals included in this report established a balanced budget for a four year period 2022 to 24 to 2026 having taken a considered view of all the relevant factors. The leader, this is the perfect time since 1974 that the council has achieved the setting of a four-year balanced budget in arguably the most extreme national economic circumstances. So, as I've the 23-24 budget, totaling 48.9 million, with a further 48.2 million to be de delivered over the period of the midterm financial plan. I wish to emphasise that these proposals will improve the outcomes for citizens. Extensive workshops, workshops carrying out extensive due diligence, have given us assurance on delivery of savings. These have been followed with business cases that set out clear delivery plans for all budget proposals. This budget, budget reflects the council's statutory requirements to deliver services and aligns with the council's delivery plan. And I note the good news of the um, the added amount of money of 3.577 million to the financial resilience reserve. Thank, Thank you, you John. John. Yeah, my council will not keep my powder dry on the debate until the, the, the council meeting. However, as I wasn't present in the room for item three, I just wanted to note my declaration of interest in that my partner works for the city council. Yes. 
we all know that. Right, just in responding, I should bring Becky Hellard in to pick up uh, the first point that you raised, John, because I, uh, I didn't quite catch it. Um, but the the second point you raised, the uh, vacancy turnover of, of 3%, this e effectively is, is keeping vacancies for a further week. So it is not envisaged that that will impact on service delivery. It's only an extra five days in actual fact on average. There are other factors in how that saving might be produced as well. If somebody leaves at the top of the grade and the new person joins at the bottom of the grade, there is then a difference in salary that uh, can be quite, quite a, a measured amount. Uh, the future of youth service and libraries, what we are doing is um, reconfiguring the way services are delivered in order to try and intervene earlier before families fall into crisis. This program is entitled Early Intervention and Prevention. It includes both the library service and the youth service. We do not envisage as we roll this program out, there'll be any reduction in library services across the city. Different buildings may be used, but no reduction in service. Uh, and then on the council tax uh, increase, um, Robert, that you uh, raised, First of all, um, the majority of councils are increasing council tax by 5%. Why are they doing that? Well, first and foremost, it's to do with the uh, long years of austerity that were applied by uh, the Conservative government since 2010. Just to remind you, this local authority in real terms has lost some £800 million over that period of time. So we're clearly, like all local authorities, we're struggling. And you've increasingly seen local authorities issuing Section 114 notices, i.e. declaring themselves bankrupt as a result of those years of uh, austerity and the way they've impacted on local governments. So we are in a, a position where we are all in the local government world struggling for funding. Also, there's the underfunding nationally of adult social care, and that's why the government keep passing the buck. Uh, and instead of sorting the problem out, they uh, allow local authorities to have an extra 2% increase in council tax to try and put a sticking plaster over that problem. It's clearly in inadequate. <laughs> and then finally, in all of the numbers issued by the government, they make two assumptions. The, the first assumption they make is that all local authorities will increase their council tax by uh, 2.99%. And then they make a second assumption that those local authorities with responsibility for adult social care will take that adult social care precept. So the government assumes that there will be a council tax increase of 5% uh, uh, for local authorities with adult social care responsibilities. And they build it into all of the numbers. So when they announce these huge investments in local, local government spending and huge investments in adult social care spending, it includes those, those two assumptions. So they've backed local authorities into a corner, really, and you're left with little choice. Finally, I would point out to you that Thurrock, Conservative Control, is increasing its council tax this year by 15%, 1.5%. Croydon, Conservative Control, Conservative Mayor, is increasing Labour its council. council is increasing its council, council tax by 10%. Labour council. May have a Labour majority, but the Mayor is uh, directly elected in Croydon and he's a Conservative mayor. The council tax increase is some 10%. That is why, as Yvonne mentioned earlier, the prudent um, oversight of council spending and the position we now find ourselves in, uh, in Birmingham City Council, is so, so important. As Yvonne has said, for the first time, we're setting a balanced budget across the medium-term financial plan as a big step forward uh, on previous years, and I think the, the council deserves some credit for it. Let me bring in Becky. Yeah, um, thanks for having us. As I said to you yesterday, I will send out a table to you on the changes between the 80 million and, and how it's come down. But I can just outline quickly here for you if that helps. So, uh, in the original assumptions, the 80 million was the October cabinet MTFP update. Um, didn't include the additional 2% council tax, about 8 million. Although we did tax pay for 3.5 million and the debt management improvement of 1.2 million. Um, the social care grant announced that the autumn, uh, the autumn statement was, was more than we expected, of 14 million. We also um, reviewed our assumptions on borrowing costs, um, which you'll make in future years. The the is saying aren't going to be as high as we originally thought. Of the cabinet. Changes in inflation assumptions. Um, th those are the principal key ones, but I'll send you out quite happily a table as you requested on showing her how those two figures relate. 
Thank you. Okay, this uh, report is uh, uh, going on to Council on the 28th when we'll have a fuller debate on the City Council's budget. In the meantime, can we agree uh, recommendations 2 1 through to 2 7? That agreed? Great. Thank you. Item 9 then is Prevention and Communities Grant Programme Redesign. Marion. Thank you. So this report is the Commission the program. The value of the TNC program is 2.7. Four five million pounds per annum, including the information, advice, and guidance contracts. There's no change to the overall budget requirement for the PNC program since the last commissioning round in 2019. And the Prevention and Community Grants Program is a historical 10 plus years grants program which has been set up to support the delivery of the Council's vision for adult social care and transformation journey by investing in preventative approaches to support older people, people with disabilities, and or people with mental health conditions. It's delivered through communities and community assets, and it enables better outcomes for citizens through things like social, increased social participation, therefore reducing social isolation and loneliness, living healthier, both in terms of well-being and physical health, maximised income and reduced debt, increased people living in their own homes and communities for as long as possible, and unpaid care and really supported in their roles as carers, but also as individuals. Um, so the PNC programme was redesigned and aligned to the Prevention First approach in 2019, and it's due to end in September 2023. Um, as I said, the annual value is 2.5 million pounds. Um, and this is for a duration of three plus um, potential two year extension. And the whole of this program will be on for the 10th of the approved grant. Thank you very much. Ewan. I don't know. I'm being positive twice. It's a back to back <laughs> item session and look at myself last night when I was doing this. You know, I'm going to love the You're clearly moving yeah. in the right direction. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but certainly around the COVID work that was done, I think I need to congratulate the officers of the council and the hard work that they did during the pandemic, I think made a real difference to the lives of the residents of the city. And um, and so I think that really needs under, underlining uh, once more. And in a wider comment, I'm not aware of anywhere else in the history of the country where it's local government around the country, ultimately. So uh, I think probably uh, it's a bit of a uh, bit of a change from the norm on that scenario. It's something probably worth dwelling on, but that's my comments on that. Thanks very much, Ian. Thank you. Uh, if there's nothing further, then, can we agree recommendations 2-1 to 2-5? Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. You, item 10, then, grant funding extension to the Active Wellbeing Society for future physical activity intervention. Marion. Thank you. Um, so following cabinet approval in 2017, a decision was taken to mutualise the strategic arm of the wellbeing service, transferring the outdoor physical activity offer to the community benefit society known as the Active Wellbeing Society. The service was transferred to tours on the 9th of July 2018, underpinned by a five-year funding agreement, which is now due to end on the 31st of March 2023. The work undertaken by tours during the first four and a half years of the funding agreement supports how working with citizens to get their more active significantly contributes to tackle health inequalities and improves both overall life expectancy as well as lived life, as well as life lived in health. Therefore, building on the Council's partnership with Tours to date, this report seeks approval to extend grant funding to the Active Wellbeing Society of up to £1.296 million per annum for a further five years, subject to annual consultation. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments on this? So, can we agree then recommendations 2 1 and 2 2? Agreed? Just Item 11, then, is market sustainability and fair cost of care fund distribution. Distribution, Marion Lillian. Thank you. So this report relates to the Council's implementation of the market sustainability and fair cost of care fund. The fund originally formed part of national reforms of adult social care in England that were announced in 2021. And although elements of the, report, of the reforms have now been postponed or adjusted, the Council has received a reinvest grant to be distributed to the regulated adult social care market in 2022-23. The primary focus of the fund was to help prepare markets for the wider social care reforms and help councils to move forward towards a fair cost of care. And to develop our approach to this, the council completed a cost, a cost of care exercise and submitted proposed spend returns and a draft market sustainability plan to government in October 2022. The report is now seeking approval of the final market sustainability plan, which sets out the position of the regulated and the social care market of Birmingham and some of the key risks and actions that need to be taken to ensure the sustainability of the market. The report also seeks approval to distribute the ring fence grant for 2022-2023 of um, £3,615,699.35 
eligible care providers, um, those being care plus for over 65, domiciliary care for 18 plus and extra care. And the report sets out that one off payment will be made to eligible care providers for 2022 2023 in line with draft submissions made to government and the data obtained through the cost of care exercise and the risks and issues that are contained within the market sustainability plan. Thank you. Any comments on this? No. In which case, can we agree recommendations 2 1 and 2 2? Agree? Agree. Thank you. Item 12, full business case and recommended contract award for North Birmingham Academy, expansion of the existing academy with a new three-storey teaching block. Karen. Thank you, Leader. Uh, the contract award report and full business case set out capital works at North Birmingham Academy at a total project cost of up to £11,663,163, subject to the school's regional director approving uh, the Birmingham Academy's proposal to expand the Academy. The City Council has a responsibility to ensure that there are sufficient pupil places to secure diversity in the provision of schools and to increase opportunities for parental choice through planning and securing additional provision. It's been identified that there's a shortfall of secondary school places in the Erdington area for September 2023 and beyond due to larger cohorts moving through from primary schools in the area. And of the four schools uh, closest to that area, North Birmingham Academy was deemed most appropriate for expansion due to being rated good by Ofsted and having suitable space to expand. North Birmingham Academy is a large co-ed secondary school in sixth form located in Perry Common, with a current capacity of 1,150 pupils. However, <coughs> it plans to increase this number by an extra 300 pupils to 1,150 over the next five years and to meet those requirements for additional secondary spaces. The current admission number is 180, which will increase to 140, which means an additional 60 year seven pupils uh, each year five years from 2023. And cost of works to provide the observation of this will be funded from the local authority to pay for the grant. Have been asked to log one, note that the decision to this report are contingent on the regional director approving the full funding of this proposal to expand. Uh, one two, approve the full business case set out in appendix A for the capital works of MBA and the total project cost of £11,163,000. Approve the award of a contract to Morgan Sindel by direct award using Constructing West Midlands 2 framework agreement known as CWM2 and authorises the Director for Children's Services to place orders for the value of £634,753 to a civic limited. Thank you. Robert. Thank you. And it's good to see the um, shortage of places being tackled. I remember sitting around this table when we used to sit over that end of the room um, four to five years ago uh, when the primary school expansions were being brought through in the area, uh, highlighting that this needs to be picked up because in four to five years there's going to be a secondary school issue if it was a primary school issue. Um, it, about the work and the site itself, uh, North Birmingham Academy um, benefits from having a, a pretty good amount of green space around it for the children to be able to use playing fields, et cetera. So I do think it's important that we make sure as part of this work that remains because it's important for providing a, a rounded education, giving them the ability to be able to do proper um, sport, et cetera. Uh, I wanted to pick up about um, something that's mentioned on page 481, actually. It touches on the work that took place in 2013. Um, in 2013, a biomass boiler was added to the site. Residents were particularly concerned about this, um, partly because of the closeness of the school to the houses surrounding it, because they can be significant sources of um, particulate matter and nitrous oxides, which obviously are bad for air quality um, in urban areas. Um, now, there are government grants to be able to replace biomass boilers. I appreciate this report is a, a, makes it clear that's not part of the scope of this work. Um, but is this something that the council can talk to the academy about, about whether or not they'll look to it, uh, see if they can get some of these government grants to be able to perhaps replace that boiling system? And can we get assurances that the new works aren't going to see any further biomass boilers added in? Should we talk to the school, Karen? 
I, I think we need to, to take that issue away. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can we agree then? Uh, recommendations two one through to two five. So agree. Yeah. Item thirteen then admission arrangements and published admission numbers for maintained and voluntary controlled schools and the local authority coordinated scheme four twenty four twenty five. Karen. Thank you, Leader. As you all recall, uh, all local authorities are required to set admission arrangements annually for the next one academic year. And where changes are proposed to admission arrangements, we must first publicly consult on those arrangements by 31st January each year. Uh, if no changes are made, then there must still be consultation every seven years. Substantial changes are not proposed to the coordinated scheme for 2024-25. The decision to consult um, on admission arrangements was due to the proposed changes to the published admission numbers of 15 schools. Following the consultation with schools and company bodies, the table at 3.6 confirms the recommended reductions at seven primary schools and one secondary school and increases at one secondary school. Um, so the recommendations are so the government the admission arrangements, the admission numbers, the for the academic year 2024-25, as set out in Appendices 1A and 1B, and approves the proposed scheme for coordinated admissions to schools for that same year, as set out in Appendix 2. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Two questions, really, and, and if the answer to most might be the council don't get involved in this, but if, it's curious to know whether they do, really. Um, so the first is around a number of these schools are proposing to go down to single form entry. Um, and I, I know from my time as a, a governor previously, um, it's becoming increasingly difficult for single form entries to be financially viable. Um, so does the uh, council have any conversation with them to ensure that they're they're in the right place financially if they're planning to reduce uh, their plan like that? And then the other side of it is because obviously part of this is around making sure there's sufficient places and you obviously don't want an over um, provision of places. But most of these schools listed um, are good rated schools as one that's an outstanding rated school. Do we have any conversation with schools about if there's going to be a reduction in places, actually having that reduction in schools that aren't good or outstanding rated rather than reducing places in schools that are? Um, I don't know if that's a conversation we get involved with, but it might be one we want to start thinking about because you obviously would make sense to see places go in the schools that are, have the worst offset ratings. Yeah, but you presumably have to create the places where the in the areas where the demand is, that rather than having kids. Possibly. So I don't know the schools by these, but I don't know if any checks being done to see is there a neighbouring school that actually that wouldn't be an issue because they're in the same area. Yeah. But we know an officer who does. Uh, Jazz, can I bring you in at this point on those questions? Yes, absolutely. Um, so two questions. Uh, the first one was around uh, conversation with schools. So um, yes, we, we've been in constant conversations with schools since the birth rates has been dropping and the migration trend has been has reversed. Um, and so far, the reduction uh, proposed is schools um, volunteering um, and uh, looking at the numbers that are coming through, the data that's coming through and making those decisions around around making that reduction um, in, the, in the pan. And um, Councillor Alden, yes, absolutely, we take into consideration the, the um, Ofsted judgment of the school. Uh, so uh, up until now, we've not had to ask a school to reduce their pan. We've had a conversation with them. Um, in fact, I'm just coming back from a meeting with the consortia. Uh, so as well as talking to individual schools, we're talking to groups of schools, whether they are in a multi-academy trust or uh, some other kind of group arrangement or whether they, uh, they're part of a consortia to share the data with them to let them have a look at what the number the years coming what the projections look like uh, and then having that conversation with them uh, not just in terms of what the finance is uh, what the what the impact on finance is but then subsequently the impact on their staffing structure and also the infrastructure as well uh, bearing in mind that the, co the the cost of living and the utility cost as well so it is it is around discussion with individual schools and um, 
I'd like to say no, none of the school make the decision lightly and none of the schools make a decision without having that conversation with the right disciplines around the table in terms of what does it mean for the finances, what does it mean for the staffing structure uh, and what does it mean for that local for that locality as well. Uh, so it's an ongoing piece of work um, and we will see more and more school uh, looking to reduce their pans. Uh, but yes, we do have those discussions with the schools very much. Thank you. In which case then, can we uh, agree recommendations 2, 1 and 2, 2? Is that agreed? Thank you. 14, Children's Travel Service Transport Procurement Strategy. Karen. Thank you, Leader. This report provides an overview of the current contractual arrangements and recommendations for the procurement of transport services going forward. That's vehicles, drivers and guides for our children's travel service. Children's Travel Service is the largest service of its kind, providing transport services to over 4,500 children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities. There are over 1,200 routes operated each day, and as in, in last September, approximately 920 of those routes require guides to support the children, these children and the needs of these children and young people. So this report sets the strategic direction for the procurement of these services, focusing on the recommended process for their required re-procurement and timescales for implementation. The report details the options explored and the recommendations proposed to support contract flexibility, to deliver, deliver robust contract management mechanisms, and the ability to deliver an agile, child-centred and responsive transport service in line with the needs of the children and young people in a timely and efficient manner. The recommended procurement process of a framework will provide the Council with clear service pricing for the next four years, moving away from the current reactive pricing mechanism, and is suitably flexible to recognise other transform transformation projects underway and any future service delivery models. In respect of implementation, the recommended option provides both service and market alike, efficient time to plan and mobilise, and ensure the continued operational success of the service. So the recommendations are that Cabinet approves the procurement of a council framework for a four-year period commencing 1st of August 2023, with an expiry date of 31st of July 2027, and authorises the Director of Children and Families or their delegate, in conjunction with the Strategic Director of Council Management or their delegate, and the City Solicitor and Monitoring Officer or their delegate, to approve the procurement strategy report prior to publication of the opportunity for a council framework, approve the award of contract to providers to be admitted to the council framework and approve any call of contract relating to the council framework. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions on this? John, we'll go with you first. Thank, thank you. Um, obviously, quite an important issue, this, and the proposal seems to make sense. Just two questions. Uh, what, one is, will the four-year framework allow flexibility to bring in new providers to come on the scene? Um, and secondly, the, the, the obvious but important question is, will there be rigorous, rigorous and regular checking of the providers and the framework to ensure they comply with all the DPS and safety standards. Follow. Uh, thank you. Um, it's interesting how this service ends up sort of coming full circle almost, because when I, I look back at the August 2019 report for the procurement strategy for the provision of a home to school transport, it says in it, um, the tender for transport framework, the main restriction with a static framework is it gradually becomes out of date as new entrants to the market are unable to bid for work, and therefore reduces potential competition. Um, and the council elected to go with a, a dynamic purchasing system. And now the council is apparently saying the dynamic purchasing system is not the best solution and that we need to move to a framework. Um, hopefully this time the council's got the right decision. Um, and I think that point John raised, I'd, I was going to raise it for example, but I'll pick it up at this point since he did, uh, about assuring that the council is, a, is approved every driver's uh, DBS check. So the, the council has that assurance is absolutely vital. It isn't mentioned in this report, and I think it's a key thing that there needs to be that commitment that the council will take responsibility for that, because it's not something that should be being uh, discharged to someone else to look at. 
When you look at the recommendations of this report, 2.1 picks up approves the procurement of a council framework, as has been mentioned by the cabinet member. 2.2 uh, delegates authority, and I think that's the wrong decision. I really think um, this should be a cabinet member decision rather than a delegated cabinet member decision. Um, this is a contract over a period of time that is going to be three to 450 millions worth of work over that time. This is a huge amount of money, and cabinet members really should be the people um, signing this off. Uh, and I think there might be some other reasons we'll come on to, which, which might also prove why that sign-off is needed. Um, but 2.21 says approves the procurement strategy prior to the publication of the opportunity for a council framework. Um, when you go down to 5.1.4, page 543, again, it, it um, highlights the same issue. And just get to that page. Um, it says the recommendations established in this cabinet report will be further developed within a subsequent procurement strategy report, which will be agreed and issued prior to the publication of the opportunity for a council framework. Um, and indeed, uh, all the options summarised in that section five clearly say the procurement process can commence after the cabinet on the 14th of February. Um, and if you turn to 8.4, page 558, um, this highlights what the procurement implications are, and it says the procurement framework will follow the open tender route and will be fully compliant with the public contractor regulation 2015. The full procurement strategy will be submitted to those officers identified. That's the issue about delegation I raised earlier, for their approval prior to the commencing of the procurement. Um, I'll come back to why those points I've just read out are important. But before that, on page 565, environmental assessment, uh, I was interested when you go through that, that it states the overall conclusion and indeed in every box is there are no environmental or sustainability impacts of this proposal. I have to say I would have thought spending 300 to 450 million on vehicles moving around the city has a very significant environmental impact. Uh, and so an environmental assessment that says there is none surely cannot be correct. Um, so I touched on uh, a number of, of items as to why I read out uh, the procurement process couldn't start until this cabinet had happened. The reason I, I did that was because um, if you go online, you can see that there was a published opportunity to join the Council's Home to School Travel Services Framework listed on the 31st of January at 4.15pm. Um, it says the DPS expires in July 2023. That's interesting because the cabinet report says it expires in October 2023. And indeed, if I go on the Council's procurement website, that also says you can still join the DPS until the 31st of October 2023, which would suggest, therefore, that one of those two descriptions is, is wrong. Uh, it highlights the value, as I've mentioned, and highlights the cabinet's delegated decisions for its officers. Uh, the Route 1 website highlights the opportunity from the 10th of February. There's a transport framework opportunity, says so the council is launching a four-year framework. Uh, and then yesterday, much to my surprise, when I um, looked on the Birmingham Mail website, there's a paid advert for the 13th of February, which is uh, the subtitle is the council is launching a four-year framework for home school transport. Um, I'm struggling to see how the council can launch a framework when the cabinet decision hasn't yet been taken. Well, you won't. Um, I will comment first because I think um, that you've raised some very, very important points there. The first point you raised was about uh, DBS checks and the council ensuring that they have oversight of those DBS checks. And that's very important given the situation that arose uh, a couple of years ago. So that needs to be the case. Um, the issue about no, no environmental uh, impact, that is probably not described in the best way it could be. Uh, this could go to one of two ways, couldn't it? So if there are more efficient uh, routes as a result of this process, then there may be uh, less environmental uh, impact. If a few vehicles would be less environmental impact, it goes the other way, there'll be greater environmental impact. So I do think that officers producing these reports need to, need to be a bit smarter in the information they're actually given. And then the final issue about the inconsistency of information across the council, I'm going to ask the chief executive to ensure that we get on top of this in, this sort of thing in future. We cannot have different dates, different processes being advertised in different places uh, across the council. We really need to get this sorted out. Carol. I think 
So you can probably have in after the enthusiast. Uh, I don't know if Becky wants to add anything on this filter process or leave it with you. So I can assure we've got rigorous processes. The council does maintain oversight of DBS processes and works closely with all the providers to sense check those DBS processes and that will continue on the framework. We're very clear about that in our corporate safeguarding policy as well. Some of those questions from Councillor Alden were very detailed and I'm happy to come back with some more detailed uh, written response. I think that's the best way to approach those questions. That's sensible. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, but we really do need to get on top of this issue of different information in different places. You and Yeah, the third attempt to try to be helpful today. I may have to change my medication. I think that the, um, you know, I think you're in a video situation here, Ian, but I think this is not the first time the we've got ourselves in a pickle around proper authorization on a procurement strategy on this. We had this uh, previously. I think we ended up with an almost an enforceable contract because of what it's happened. And can I suggest that this item is is like deferred or taken away and investigated? Because I just think that, you know, this keeps reoccurring. Um, it puts the council, you know, at risk of a challenge. And I think as well, I'm not sure this is totally constitutional. I think before anyone comes to any decisions on it, we probably take it away to go away and to go away and have a look at it. I don't think, Ewan, that we need to defer this. Uh, you've heard what I've uh, asked of the chief executive about uh, misinformation going out from the organisation, but I don't think we should be um, deferring this particular report. I do think we need to uh, get on and make some changes in this particular area. Robert? Thank you. Perhaps to just help, can someone clarify then if this report meets the constitution? Because Part D, Section 4, Process, Route to Market 4.54, um, so the procurement process should not be commenced unless a strategy report has been approved. This item references in numerous areas a strategy report will be produced after the Cabinet decision. And yet a prime information notice has already been published for the framework. Yeah. Yeah. Take us some advice from the legal office. The uh, advice is that we should defer this report. So we will defer it uh, in order to sort out all of the information uh, and make sure that we've got this uh, in line with the City Council's constitution. Thank you. Item 14 then is Children's Travel Service Transportation Transport Procurement Strategy. No, sorry, that's the one we've just uh, we've just done, isn't it? Over the page then. Uh, item 15, housing revenue account rent setting 2023 to 24. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is the um, rent setting paper. And let's take it as red, although I'm being told that when I say that it's red, I haven't really much enough. <laughs> 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 so, um, so, um, it's important that we look at the rent setting over the next financial year um, in line with um, the business planning proposals that we've put forward. Um, as you can see throughout all the conversations that have been happening nationally with the cost of living crisis um, and everything else in terms of inflation, the government have um, put a rent cap in place for um, 7%. So one of the things that we have done when considering um, the rents moving forward was not just look at the council and what was happening with the council, but, but also speaking to our partners and other housing associations across the city in terms of what they were doing and also taking into consideration with what other core cool cities were doing nationally as well. So all of those considerations were taken into place. And whilst we agree in principle with the um the notion to have the rent cap, it has to be said that that also means that has an impact on the level of um, investment that can go into some of our properties as a, a consequence of that. So the um, paper that sets out will give you clear guidance of what we're suggesting in terms of um, where we'll be pitching the rent both on um, our housing properties, but also in terms of homelessness. 
um, and also the fact that this has been aligned with our current strategic priorities, which has included building and fire safety, which we've made huge investments in over the previous years post-Grenfell. Post also, um, in terms of decent homes, the fact that, you know, we need to increase um, decency levels within our council homes across the city. And then also taking into consideration Route to Zero and supporting wider regeneration um, opportunities that are coming through. So uh, that's where I am. I'm assuming, as I said, that you've all read. And um, that's it, Leader. Back to you. Thank you very much. Ewan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ian. Uh, I think if I've read the poll correctly, um, I think we're looking at a 7% increase in rent and a 5 to 7% increase in service charge. And um, I think those not paying this through housing benefit were really hurt and hit really hard by this. I think that what probably will stick in the core quite a few of the residents will be that um, if you consider the condition of some of our council stock at the moment paying seven percent increase in rent and a five percent five to seven service charge you're going to be looking at what are you getting for some of your uh, return i think we had a debate on something along these lines at full council and i think there was unanimity there that um the quality of um some of the some of the housing stock was um less than acceptable so they're trying to choose a very Light form of words, I think somebody described as big as slum landlord in Birmingham. But I think that um, there are some positives. I think that if if you could look to reintroducing the concierge system, I think that would bring a lot of a lot of positive. For that I think the service charge does list a fee for this at the Bloomsbury MB, uh, which hasn't had some of the problems that some of the some of the other areas. And I think if you could show residents some sort of a turn for their increase, I think. I, th I think that might go down a bit easier. But at the moment, I think there's a lot of people talking about how people are struggling financially at the minute. And I think the council here is not doing something that's really helping out sort of some of the most vulnerable in society. Thanks very much, Ian. Oh. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think tenants appear to be struggling with a shortfall investment over, over the years. A portion of decent homes have been falling. So you do need the investment. Two, two questions which I didn't find answered in the report. One is that the 7% will hit some people disproportionately, quite a lot probably, because you can't assume that that many people are getting a 7% earnings increase in the present climate. And of course, we know that's one of the reasons for major unrest across the country, because an awful lot of people aren't getting um, increases of, of, of that level. Um, so what is going to be done to, to identify genuine cases of hardship where people can't afford the rent increases, where it just impacts the budget too much? Uh, the second thing, which I didn't see an answer to, is is what is the sectoral inflation? What's the inflation rate within this sector? Because at the moment, the inflation increases are very much sort of partial. They're affecting sectors differently. Um, clearly, labour shortages can be a big factor if there are, if there are labour shortages. But I didn't see it in the report any any analysis of what the uh, inflation rate is within this sector. Um, Okay. First of all, um, uh, Councillor Mackey, um, taking on board the comments that, that you've just made, um, you know, there is a housing crisis across the country, and I keep repeating that, it's not just in Birmingham. And, you know, you know, it's those sentiments that you've given in terms of our council properties, you know, it's no different, you know, everybody is feeling the difference, whether you have a bought property, those that have got mortgages are now feeling the difference because of decisions that were made nationally by the government in terms of inflation, which is, you know, impacted on inflation and other things. This is happening across the country. It's across the council in terms of the rent setting. It's in, line locally. it's in line with the local other housing associations as well. In terms of the um, concierge service, um, if we was to bring back in the concierge service, that is, we have to make the point that that would come at a cost again in terms of service charges. So that would have an impact there, but it is being explored. Um, so, you know, really, I understand the sentiments in terms of the decency of proper, some properties within the housing um, in Birmingham, particularly for Birmingham City Council, but we have invested more money over the last year in terms of 
bringing things back up to decency. Again, I make the point that the reason why we didn't for the three years before is because we took the decision to um, invest into fire safety for tower blocks, which I think was the right thing to do. And, you know, there's a plan moving forward where we will be increasing investment moving forward. In terms of Birmingham City Council, we're talking to the sum of eight, over £80 million to go into um, the decency of property. So we are taking that seriously and we are working to improve the standards within the, um, the council property. So we will take responsibility for our side. I cannot take responsibility for the fact that some of the decisions that have led to some of the issues taking place across housing is because of national decisions that have come directly from the government. Um, Councillor Hunt, in regards to um, hardship, one of the things that we have continued to do in housing since the pandemic really and before the pandemic has really been keeping, keeping a close eye in terms of the rental accounts of those that are falling into hardship even further. So we have been looking at that and we continue to do that when it's coming into the cost of living crisis. I keep saying we have not hit the eye of the storm when it comes to the cost of living crisis yet. And we will see a huge impact in that space. Um, so that work is continuing to go on. We have recently produced a cost of living advice pack for our tenants, but also something that's going out across housing associations. So they know where to go for help and support. And obviously Birmingham City Council has done a huge amount in terms of making sure that it has put things, put money in place in terms of the cost of living crisis, which our tenants will also be able to access. So there's a huge amount of work that is taking place. But one thing I will take the opportunity to do is to urge anyone that is slightly falling into crisis to please come forward as soon as possible, because that means that we can help to put some intervention and prevention into place, which is taking place through adult social care and also through the housing department as we speak. In terms of the question around inflation in line with the um, housing sector, I will pass that over to Guy, I think, to answer that one question. Well, just before you do, Guy, let me uh, make some comments as, as well, because um, 7% is uh, an increase that's uh, more than has happened uh, over, over recent years. So I think there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, um, we should all be aware that uh, this increase is below inflation. Inflation uh, um, is currently running at some 9.2% uh, in the 12 months to December 2022. That includes, that figure for inflation includes uh, uh, occupiers housing costs. So they are taken into account uh, with that. Uh, secondly, if you put that 7% increase into context, private rents in Birmingham increased by an average of 17.6% in the 12 months to October of 2022. We've an increase, uh, agreed this increase in our rents of 7%, but it's as John Hunt pointed out, part of this is to enable us to uh, lever the investment that is needed into the housing stock. And again, if I just remind everyone, uh, uh, much of our housing stock is over 70 years old. Uh, it's the largest uh, um, authority with social uh, housing in excess of some 60,000 properties, it is quite a challenge to invest in uh, housing stock of that age and keep it up to the standard required. So we do need to strike a, a balance in all of this. And then we should also bear in mind that the government's consultation on rent increases did conclude and agree that a 7% increase was appropriate to both protect social tenants from high rent increases whilst allowing for adequate investment into housing stock. On top of that, uh, to pick up where Karen, uh, Sharon left off, all tenants uh, as part of our cost of living support will be sent in the next couple of weeks a leaflet giving practical help and sources of financial support for dealing with the impact of this increase. We know it's not the only pressure that people will come under over the coming months with inflation still running uh, uh, to record levels. In addition to that, energy bills are set to rise by a significant uh, figure in April of this year. So as a local authority, we will continue to do all we can to support our residents, whatever their housing tenure. Guy. I think, I think you've answered the question there in terms of inflation. I'd like to pick up some of those key points that, that the Council Thompson highlights around the you know, potential risks that we have in terms of delivering those investment priorities that, that we've got at the moment, specifically around the decent homes gap, specifically around building fire safety and, and also around 
very supporting the Route to Zero programme. Um, and not to lose sight of the fact that certainly with the decent tissue, we would be prepared to move into the types of regulatory regime. So it's really important that we do target that investment to money. Thank you. Uh, if there's no further comments, then can we agree recommendations 2 1 through to 2 5? So agreed. 16 then, homelessness prevention grant for the winter of 22 23. Sharon? Sharon, not Helen? <laughs> Positive, <laughs> Sharon. <laughs> okay, so um, this is just for um, approval in terms of a um, homelessness prevention top up grant, um, which will be in line, um, spending would be in line with our plan for the um, original grant that we've been for. Um, I know that this committee likes things to be forward quite early. However, the um, government told us without any full warning in November that this was a potential. So um, one of the things with this is that um, the money has to be spent by the 31st, by the end of the financial year, um, which is a huge task for anybody, considering the sums of money. But it's also been clear in saying that actually what Birmingham spends in this area probably outweighs the amount that we're getting in terms of the grant. Um, the teams have been looking at whether the, the deliverables are around and confident that we can get through this and been able to spend the money. And it will be able to support some very significant areas, particularly around um, house, housing solutions and um, when it comes to the case workers and the work that takes place in those in terms of the move on and other areas of that. And also looking at um, supporting the complex case team, which often have some really complex issues, which comes with comes through when people are presenting themselves in a homelessness situation. Um, as I've said, the timescales are pretty tight. It's such a substantial amount of is coming in, um, and the the team are looking at how they would be able to mobilise quite quickly, enable to, to to enable them to spend the full sum. Um, and so I'm just asking the committee to approve the recommendations. Thank you. Good. And thank you, Ian, and thank you, Sharon. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, well done, Sharon, for the two items I was going to mention, but I'll still mention them because I still want a bit of clarification on it because obviously welcome government money here. Um, the... But I understand which is what I was going to say was that this was announced on the 30th of November. It wasn't a potential. It was announced on the 30th of November. And here we are on the 14th of February bringing it to Cabinet. I mean, I'm wel welcoming it anyway around. It's just in the spirit of what Ian said earlier on about tightening these things up to make sure that we, we all move together in one scenario. I can't see why this couldn't have come last month, actually, or even earlier than that. But uh, other than that, I welcome the money. But the sooner this gets deployed, the better, really. Thank you very much. I think some of the things that we face in terms of the housing portfolio, particularly, and um, I guess Graham probably say the same about all social care. Sometimes there's a very little warning that comes through in terms of money that's being made available. Sometimes it is the all the time, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be stopped in order to get on with getting these bids pulled together in a business case in order to get here in the first place. So I think that's probably some of the key reasons that happen in that particular scenario. So I would just say that, you know, we will welcome the money that's coming our way. But um, often um, the council's operation and constitution doesn't always aligned with the way that the government thinks and behaves a lot of the time, which means that, you know, we are where we are and this is why it's being brought to the Cabinet today. Thank you. Can we agree on the recommendations 2-1 through to 2 one five? So agree? Thank you. 17, Local Authority Housing Fund grant to support acquisition of accommodation for Afghan citizens and Ukrainian guests. Sharon again. And um, so this particularly talks about an opportunity for us to be able to draw down some funding for a capital grant to purchase some properties as part of our acquisitions programme. This will be specifically for um, families that are coming from, um, that are here from Ukraine. Um, we're talking about 30 properties in total between the two programmes. It's a good sum of money and it will support the work that we're doing currently. I would also say that, um, you know, Councillor Cotton and I have regular conversations around this area because we sit next to each other in the office. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, there has been concerns that have hit our desk on a number of occasions around other, other providers that have come through in terms of the Home Office, um, in terms of the people that they, they get to commission to sort of the properties. And we would prefer, actually, to support in this way through the council because it actually means that we can where people are, but also means that they make sure that they get the support that they need. 
I'm not sure if John's got anything. Oh, John. Thank you. You. Yeah, thanks very much. I think Birmingham should be very proud about how it's responded to the um, whole scenario around uh, sort of Afghan and Ukrainian uh, guests. I think we recently saw uh, a video of people who have taken some uh, Ukrainians uh, into their own homes and um, they were very candid uh, and they gave them a lot of support. It wasn't without sort of some some of the families who took them in had to have some sort of adjustments. But I think that's only to be expected if you've got people you don't know coming into your home. But I, if, the whole thing's been a really good, positive success. And um, I welcome, obviously, that we're getting properties here to for these people to go in. I, I think it's important that the whole of the council area sees that not only we're looking at, uh, you know, housing these people who are in desperate need um, of support, we just need to make sure that our own council stock in that is OK, is a similar quality here. So treating everyone equitably, I think that's very important uh, for um, the whole society, really. And I, I just think that the only thing I, I would like to see is the government making sure that sort of um, all these guests are spread equally along the country. I think there seems to be some councils seem to be taking uh, heavier, um, a heavier responsibility, I think is the right word to use. And I think it'd be better if uh, it was spread equally across the country and everyone could see the benefits because there's benefits. There's not just negatives. Uh, and um, but so that's all I've got to say on that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. This seems a a useful opportunity, doesn't it, to provide extra support for these families and also to expand the council's uh, housing stock, which is which is much needed. Just a couple of questions. In in the report, it makes it clear the grant is, is not adequate to recommendations. How do we purchase? Uh, I think it's roughly speaking, is about half the money that's needed. Am I correct in, in thinking that um, the idea is that it will, will go into the temporary accommodation purchase fund and that will provide the top up? When it's needed for these houses, uh, and the second, when we're could, could I just ask that people who are joining this meeting online mute their microphones, please? Sorry, John. Um, when when we're placing these families in temporary accommodation, I, I, I presume there's a package of support for them as well, because th things is not just providing support for them, but for instance, people from Ukraine may well suffer bereavement um, while they're in this country. There need to be people on hand to support them. Yes, yeah, so this, yeah, this is the part of the, um, it all goes back to the end. The support, there is support being provided for people in temporary accommodation, and particularly those that are low from the Ukraine, not just all those perspectives. Housing side, we would just make sure in terms of that they're in need, they've got the accommodation and we'll give the other additional wraparound support that's provided through temporary accommodation anyway. And um, so that will um, take place. And just to be really clear that, um, you know, this is temporary accommodation and this doesn't supersede um, the allocations policy in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, so we're making sure that it's as fair and equitable as possible, making sure that our guests do have the support that they need whilst they're with us here in Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, can we now agree then uh, recommendations 2.1 through to 2.6? Agree. 18 then is Hackney Carriage and Private Hire Policy. Liz. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so this is a report looking forward the Hackney Carriage and Private Hire Policy um, for consideration and approval by Cabinet. Um, I've got um, Emma Roham on, our licensing manager, with me in case there are any um, detailed queries. But what I just want to say very briefly on this occasion uh, is that the documents are restatement and reformatting of the existing policies relating to the licensing of hackney carriage and private hire vehicles. Um, the aim is that the document is format, formatted in a much more accessible and user friendly style. Um, so it will make the process, the licensing process, considerably clearer for everybody and the documents will all be accessible online. We are required to, uh, to publish a standalone policy um, as part of the st uh, statutory guidance. And if we didn't comply with this, there would be a challenge from the Department of Transport. Um, and it could undermine the actions um, we take to apply the policies of administering the licensing service. The one aspect of this um, document, which is new as, as in policy, um, is, a, is a clause to address those vehicles which have been subject to a complete repowering and refurbishment to become fully electric. Um, for those vehicles, the date for which the age is calculated will be taken as the date from which the refurbishment was carried out. And this is to recognise the significant cost involved and the extent of the work. And it's important to emphasise that this is not simply an engine 
conversion, but a total refit of, of the of the vehicle. Um, and that's an issue that we've um, talked about a lot. Um, colleagues from the clean air zone team have been con con um, consulted and they don't have any concerns. Um, and I've had an extensive briefing about that because I wanted to understand what was being proposed there and I'm happy with it. The document will be subject to regular review and will be updated as appropriate. Um, so just finally to say, just in, in um, organisational terms, the administration of the licensing function is a non-executive function of the City Council carried out through the Licensing and Public Protection Committee. So this draft policy has also been presented to LPPC for comment and there weren't any um, further suggestions for amendments. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you. Um, and as the report says in 3.1, it was in July 2020 that this national guidance was uh, issued. One of the aspects of it is that there should be driver criminal records checks every six months. Um, I'm not sure whether the existing policy had that in, to be honest, and the cabinet member may want to touch on that. But clearly there's been six lots of, or we're in the sixth lot of six months since then. Um, so the question it really ponders to oneself is how come it has taken so long for something that was published as national guidance in July 2020 with an instruction on the DFT website to carry this out as soon as possible for us not to implement this until February 2023. Yes. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask Emma. Just to say, we did do an extensive um, comparison between what Department of Transport requirements are, what our existing policy requirements were, and there was very little um, discrepancy, um, almost none, in fact. And so we did. And take steps to make sure that we did comply with those. Any changes that we were going to make, we went out for consultation to see whether there would be any adverse impact. Um, so we did. We have been working on it. We haven't just um, just sat there, but we were very close um, to the existing policy. It was already agreed um, through the um, requirements for the update service for CBS, um, and obviously we're working with. The restrictions that we had throughout COVID in terms of being able to work through that update service as well. But um, so we have been working on it to get it to this stage um, and to get the all into the correct format. And we have just changed our licensing software system during that time as well, which led to some delays in terms of how we could process those applications. But that, that's what's been happening in that meantime. Okay, can we agree then recommendation 2 1? Thank you. Uh, Midlands Arts Centre, Jane. Thank you. Um, this is a report, um, uh, a briefing paper rather, about Midlands Arts Centre, MAC. Um, in March 2020, Cabinet approved the setting up urban endowment fund for Midlands Arts Centre. And a total of £1.4 million was provided to invest in order to ensure an ongoing income. In return, um, it was agreed that uh, the council would no longer provide an annual grant to the organisation. Mac have only recently concluded. Although given interest uh, rates rises recently, this may have improved, but would also fall again once rates stabilise, of course. So the MAC is a member of the PSATSA, which is the Pension Scheme for Administration and Technical Staff in the Arts. Um, this is a defined benefit scheme set up by the Arts Council, but from no, 2009 was no longer available to new employees. Annual payments to the fund are expected to be about £110,000 a year to cover the current fund deficit and to keep the payments at this level. The term of the debt would have to be extended for a further three years. MAC approached the Council in November last year for permission to use the endowment as they had a buyout valuation for the fund. Taking this option means that they are no longer liable for any fund deficits going forward. It de-risks the pension for them and provides certainty. For the medium term at least, the annual benefit is around eight, eight to eight per year. That's based on the financial report. The estimate was 996k to exit the scheme. So the trustees have written to the council sharing their intent to exit the pension scheme. Of course, as no formal agreement concerning the endowment is in place, then the trustees do not need our permission to, to do this. However, in good faith, they are requesting our views. The council cannot comment on whether we agree with the independent report on the exit of the pension, as we need to ensure that we are not giving any financial opinion to MAC. 
Officers, however, recommend that Cabinet offers no objections to the use of the endowment to buy out the pension liability. There will be approximately £450,000 subject to a final valuation remaining in the endowment fund, and a letter will be sent, written and sent to trustees seeking their confirmation these funds can be used to further support the financial sustainability. So um, I'm asking Cabinet to note the report and approve recommendations 2.1 to 2.4. If there are any um, questions, we have both uh, Rebecca and Alison Janet, Janet on the call who, who will answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would have thought my understanding of the endowment fund when um, such things are set up is, is the idea that effectively the interest or the return you generate from the original capital is what you would use and you preserve the original capital so it lasts forever. Um, clearly in this situation, what, two thirds of the original capital is going to be used up by this proposal. Um, fully appreciating that the comment from the cabinet member about the council not getting involved in giving financial advice um, to them, but I would have expected to see some kind of plan attached to this report uh, and, and maybe the MAC has one and it's just not attached to this report around what the impact on the endowment for the next you know, 10, 20 years will be of this decision and how that affects the sustainability organisation. Um, the comment from the cabinet member about there wasn't sort of any conditions on it perhaps means as a council we ought to be looking at how we set up endowment funds going forward. So there is a bit, bit more oversight because I, I'm all in favour of setting them up, but we don't want to be setting up endowment funds that simply require the council to put more money in two years later because they've all been spent because there was no sort of guidance around their expenditure. Let me just pick up uh, a couple of those points then. So um, we entered into this arrangement as part of an innovative approach to grant funding the Midlands Arts Centre. You recall uh, a number of years ago, uh, the major arts organisations were all looking for different ways to, to mitigate against uh, what appeared at the time to be ever-reducing grant. Two things were arrived at with MAC. The first was uh, sharing car parking uh, income at the car park at uh, Cannon Hill Park. And the second was this endowment fund. Now, the intention was that that would remove the need for the council to continue to grant uh, aid Midlands Arts Centre. The reason this proposition has come forward is that this is uh, paying off the uh, pension liability is more beneficial financially to MAC than continuing with the endowment fund. So it is a sensible thing to do. There will still be some money left over, as you've indicated, and we will be writing to them uh, about that to ensure that that continues as uh, an endowment fund. But taking all of that in the round and the benefit to one of the uh, key arts organisations in the city, the view is that this is the right course of action to take. Okay, uh, with that then, can we agree recommendations 2-1 through to 2-4? So I'd agree. Uh, 20 is appointments to outside bodies. There are two uh, this month. First of all, Birmingham Wholesale Market Management Company. The recommendation is that Paul Kitson be appointed for the period of 14th of February 23 through to 27th of June this year. The second one is Kings Norton United Charities. The recommendation here is that Councillor Debbie Clancy is appointed for a further three-year term expiring on the 13th of February 2026. Are they agreed? Thank you. Uh, 19 then is key decisions, planned procurement activities for the period March 23 through to May 23 and the quarterly contract awards. Yvonne. 21, not 19. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, no, sir. Item 19, come on. 21. 21, not 19. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah the numbering is incorrect on the uh, agenda I've been given. Thank Item you, 21, yeah. Thank you, Leader. Um, this report is the standard or usual report that provides details of the plan procurement activity for the period stated in the report. These are key decisions made on the Chief Officer delegations. I ask the Cabinet to approve the recommendations and the report. Robert. Uh, thank you. Number two, which is the managed service provider to support transformation. Um, without going into details that aren't in a public, I'd just suggest that ought to be a full cabinet report rather than a um, delegated one because of the levels. This is what, sorry? The levels. Try not to say anything I'm not allowed to say in public. <laughs> <laughs>
You're asking this to be a, a cabinet report. Okay, let me bring in uh, Becky Hello. Thanks. So, you know, there was for the moment just to explain the essence of what we're trying to achieve. So, the the, the idea is that we uh, go to one of the specific managed service providers, be that ESPO, YPO, Bloom, Constellia, one of those, to, to have them on board so that we can call off contracts without having to get delays in, um, and, and hence the, the size of this, which I know is, is one of the issues that you're raising with Pastor Alden, is that, that those monies would then be spent over a period of time, but it allows us to use competition every time we want to go to use that framework. The essence is to get delivery parts in to help us to actually deliver much more effectively and much faster. And I've used the example I've used, I know, in explaining it to other members, um, moving from a one-star failing finance service to a three-star, you know, uh, exemplar in 12 months was helped by having a delivery partner on board. It, without that, we, we, we never get the capacity to make the change because we're still trying to deal with all of the service issues that need to be mended. And not just in finance, I'd say that's a, a big, pretty much across the board. Um, so, so that's uh, that. That's what this is attempting to do. And I think what the question is is because of the size of it, would that warrant a separate cabinet report in its own right, rather than being on the PPAR? And, and I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. So we'll bring a cabinet report on this particular item. Anyone else? Okay, in which case then can we agree recommendations two one to two with that one uh, amendment, please. Great. Thank you. Uh, item 22 then, non-key decisions, uh, plan procurement activities and quarterly contract awards for the period of October 22 through to December 22. Yvonne. Thank you, Leader. This is the, the standard or usual report that provides details of the plan procurement activity for the period stated in the report these are, as you said, normal key decisions made by the cabinet, hopefully, to approve the recommendations and the report. Any comments on this? In which case, then, can we agree recommendations 2 1 to 2? Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. I have a declared pecuniary interest in respect of the final item on the agenda, so I will now withdraw and pass the chair to the Deputy Leader. Uh, we're now on item 23, response to the independent review of Birmingham Special Educational Needs and Disability Information Advice and Support Service, Sendias, Karen. Thank you, Deputy Leader. I formally move to defer on this item. Agreed. Agreed. Is that agreed? Oh, excuse me. I've got a hand up in the air to raise it. <laughs> um, since it's deferred, I don't think there's any discussion that needs yes. to take place until next time. Yeah, thank you. I will just raise you in council and ask you. Okay, that takes then on to, so that's agreed, that takes us on to 24 other urgent business. There being none, that's the end of the meeting. Thank you. Just the urgent business.